the abnormal flow. So in addition to these five uh, Zamboni criteria, you can oftentimes see abnormalities, abnormalities within the vein itself, such as septums, flaps, etc. I won't spend a lot of time with that. Well, the similar venous obstructions exist in non-NMS non patients. And going from ultrasound to actually venography, a series of 65 MS patients and 45 controls underwent venography. Looking at stenosis, none of the controls had evidence of venous stenosis. In MS patients, stenosis of the azagus was found in 86%, and in internal jugular, 91%. This was published in the Journal of Vascular Surgery. Okay, what else can we take? Well, I don't have time to go through all of these, but there are other things from MR looking at mean transit time, the actual cerebral perfusion, looking at uh, uh, CSF flow, obviously the, the cycle of flow and, and, the, and the association with venous obstruction, sizes of third ventricles. Actually, the amount of veins can be quantitated by MR now. Here's just one example of that from perfusion MR imaging. Look at transit times here, and you can see patients not only in areas of the brain that are involved with MS, but in normal appearing white matter, the transit time was significantly prolonged versus the normal controls over here on the right. So again, we have this paradigm here starting with the abnormal venous hemodynamics, endothelial damage, blood-brain barrier breakdown, et cetera. And this fits very nicely with what some, the sort of splinter group in neurology that's publishing. This is from December Annals of Neurology of last year. And you can see here this sort of counter, sort of another splinter off to the side, but association with a group of neurologists saying that MS may not be primarily, or may be primarily a degenerative disorder rather than an autoimmune disease. That's because when this group of investigators looked at the earliest uh, presentation of disease at the morphology in patients who had just the earliest plaques, there was relatively little T or B cell infiltration, in where clearly there was already evident evidence of myelin degeneration, which was well established. So again, these markers that are the hallmarks of autoimmune or immune reactive phenomena appear not to be present at ground zero in individual patients. So what's the history of management for cerebral venous obstruction? Briefly, in 1994, we uh, first published uh, work in stenting of veins in the brain. Uh, this is one patient that I treated was a, actually a law student from Emory who came in with a non-pulsatile buzzing tinnitus in her ear. You can see the transverse sinuses are both narrowed. This is after I placed a wall stent in one of the sinuses and her tinnitus uh, immediately resolved when she woke up. And now, as you can see from out the literature, the treatment of idiopathic intracranial hypertension or pseudotumor cerebri is now stenting intracranially. So again, it's sort of an evolution going on there. Why are stents used in certain situations? What's their role? Well, we, as we well aware in interventional radiology, venous obstruction doesn't usually respond in a durable manner to balloon angioplasty. Stents and veins obviously counteract the recoil, but with both PTA and stents, re-narrowing can be common, especially in dialysis. When do we use plano balloon angioplasty in these patients? It's always the first choice, always the initial therapy. It does do well, especially in valvular issues or membranous lesions with their annual osteal junctional lesions, and we always use it in dural sinuses first. When do we use stents? Well, for all the reasons you, you use stents in any application for residual disease, stenosis, gradients, residual collateral networks or residual symptoms. Are any stents FDA approved for the treatment of venous obstruction anywhere? No, you know that. There are no stents that have ever been put forth to the FDA for consideration of general clinical approval. Here's from Scott Teratola, SVC syndrome with a patent SVC treatment of internal jugular venous occlusion. It's a patient who had cancer. You can see occlusion. He had symptoms of SVC with a syndrome with a patent SVC. That's after stenting. This patient saw an 18-year-old obtunded status post-assault by some other youths. He came in with a normal CT of the brain and carotids, but bilateral Ig internal jugular thrombosis, obtunded. This is what it looked like, and this is a typical appearance we often see in these patients with MS, with these large uh, vertebral uh, collaterals coming around the occiput and down. And this is after stenting in this patient. So where did these venous obstructions occur? Well, they can occur anywhere. The exact location is nonspecific. High jugular, this is a typical appearance around C1, where the lateral mass transverse process of C1 provides a backboard, much like down in May Turner, the bony posterior aspect. This is what it looks like at this level, an oblique. Other side, bilateral, as you might imagine. 
We're constructed anatomically for redundancy, so you're often looking for something that takes out that redundancy. If you just see one side, you have to be extra diligent to look at the other side. Could it be valvular, another location? Could it be azagous? Here you can see the flattening of these veins. That's the jugular vein on the left. That's the less flattened jugular vein on the right. This is sitting right on the C1, which is, as you well know, the most prominent lateral process or transverse process below that. It appears more normal. This is what it looks like on a CT scan. You can see the jugular vein here encroached here by the transverse process of C1. This is a patient looking much like that assaulted youth, and this is what we see, patient with MS. That's after, in this case, using stents. Uh, I'm not, you know, here to tell you that this talk was entitled stenting, but I think that's sort of really not the message I want to deliver. It's more this, we should be looking for these, and we really don't understand exactly the causes of all these lesions, how many are really functional, how many are intrinsic vein disease. It appears that the locations are nonspecific, but also the etiologies may be multifactorial. Here's mid-jugular, another area we see, big collateral, sort of bucket handle going around this narrowing, and this narrowing is caused by sort of smearing of the jugular here by the carotid bulb, which is ectatic and coming across it. This is pre, that's post stenting, and you can see the collaterals disappear. Low jugular lesions are almost always associated with valvular abnormalities, where the valve orifice or the essential flow, uh, flow orifice is limited. You can see very prominent valve cusps here on the left associated with that, and stasis of flow on the left. Oftentimes these respond to angioplasty alone, pre and post, sometimes not, big bucket handle collateral to the subclavian, lateral to the confluence, big prominent valve cusp here as you can see on the left, angioplasty, bucket handle still there, in this case after stenting it's gone. Azagus, this typical azagal appearance with the junction of the more horizontal and the vertical segment of the azagus, the sort of candy wrapper bird beaking is a constellation that we oftentimes see. This is pre and post stenting. These, in my experience, do not respond well to balloon angioplasty. As you can see here, as opposed to collaterals going around the lesion, the collaterals go back posteriorly into other segmental branches, as you can see here. This is this bird beak or candy wrapper lesion in the typical location pre and post stenting. So what are the anticipated short and long term outcomes of this? Well, it remains to be seen. Clearly, global symptoms that are attributed to MS, the so-called cognitive brain fog, fatigue, lethargy, somnolence, heat sensitivity, urinary urgency, especially at night, all of these things respond fairly well to this treatment because really I think these are more accurately characterized as symptoms of venous obstruction rather than directly due to a specific anatomic loci that a demyelinated plaque has unfortunately hit. If unfortunately you're on the more advanced or progressive state of the EDSS scale where mobility is a real issue and that plaques have gone to certain areas, unfortunately cerebellum, et cetera, you have weakness paralysis, this is not going to help that in the short term. You can't remyelinate this and I don't know if you'll ever be able to heal it. But the, in the middle is this question of can you possibly prevent uh, further deterioration, alter the natural trajectory or the tempo of disease progression by providing a better blood-brain barrier by reducing this venous obstruction. Summary analysis, at least right now, it appears that many of these lesion sites are nonspecific. They can occur anywhere. Many of the lesion etiologies can be due to different things, osseous impingement, arterial compression, functional, but certainly the valvular area is getting a lot of attention right now as being one of the more primary locations. So I think my message is stay tuned. We'll see what happens next year, but this is clearly something I think we can all look closely at and contribute to by our own uh, investigation and work with patients. Thanks, Matt.